All right, well, today in our message, we continue our sermon series. I said this earlier, we're in a preach this series where you guys, and you can still do this, text in some ideas to me. You guys throw movies or songs at me, and I have a week to try and build a sermon out of it. And today is awesome because as a Notre Dame fan, this is one of my favorite movies, and no, I did not pick it. It was picked out there, and I, of course, jumped all over it. Rudy, one of the greatest movies. You don't have to like Notre Dame. This is one of the greatest movies of all time. And so what we're going to do is what we usually do in this series. I'm going to give you a quick recap of what the story is is in case you don't know it. Then I'm going to tell you about a story in the Bible that I think it relates to, and then we're going to break it down and take the lessons from both stories, okay? So here's Rudy in a nutshell for you. All right, first video. This is little Rudy sharing his dream. Um, so uh, Rudy is a little kid growing up in Illinois, a huge Notre Dame fan. His dream is to one day play for Notre Dame. Rudy is not very big, and he's not very smart, as we'll learn in this next little scene. Oh, damn. So all his life, everyone's been mocking him, telling him this isn't going to happen. You're not going to go to Notre Dame. Um, and so he ends up getting a job at the steel mill his dad works at, his brothers all work at, um, with his best friend Pete. But then one day, they're at the steel mill. Spoiler alert, Pete doesn't make it. Um, and this is a true story. This is a true story of what happened. His best friend Pete was killed in that, that accident there. And so that motivates him to say, enough of this. He, he's 22. He's going to go try to make it into Notre Dame and play football at Notre Dame. And so uh, after the funeral, he's sitting at the, the bus stop and his dad uh, getting ready to go to South Bend. And his dad tells him this. And so he goes up there. He can't get into the school, obviously. So he goes across the street to Holy Cross uh, Junior College college and he gets a tutor um he he uh, trades the, he has no money so the his deal with the tutor is he has to introduce him to girls and uh and so he gets his grades up and he tries and so each semester he applies at notre dame gets rejected three times it finally comes to the last time of you know two years of junior college this is his last chance and uh he gets a letter telling him that he has been accepted and the first thing he does is run home to tell dad so he starts in Notre Dame. Uh, he goes out for the football team. He obviously is uh, very small. He's five foot even and weighs barely 100 pounds. But he goes on to the, the, the tryout um, as a walk-on. So he's playing his way onto the team. Um, and he gets a lot to be a squad, which means he just gets to beat, uh, beat up in practice. He doesn't get to go into any of the games. He doesn't get to wear, they call it dressing. He doesn't get to wear the uniform on the sideline even. He watches the game like everybody else. And so for two years, he works hard on the practice team. He tries his best. The team learns to respect him, and the coach learns to respect him so much that he says, I'll tell you what, Rudy, one game your senior year, I'll let you guys be on the field so your whole family see you and be a part of the university. Because he says, nobody knows, nobody believes me. And so he says, I'll, I'll let you do this. One game. The problem is at the end of that season, the coach quits. And so a new coach comes in, and he doesn't honor that promise. And so Rudy tries, and he tries. And then it's the very last game of the season. Rudy doesn't get picked to be on the field. And so the captains and all of the team, one by one into the coach, lay their jerseys down and say, I want Rudy to take my spot. And the coach says, this is ridiculous. But then the whole team, one by one, comes in, and they say, I want Rudy to take my spot. And so they let Rudy dress, and he gets to... to uh, come in to the game. He calls everybody he knows to come and see the game, and this is the ending. This is how it ends. And don't be afraid. You can chant Rudy with them if you want. It's a very good story. If you want to go watch a movie, it's an awesome story. It's a true story. And, it, and what impresses people about it is it's a guy who everyone told him he was wrong. Everybody rebuked him and, and mocked him for his dream that he had. Um, but he worked hard. He persevered through a lot of different setbacks, kept pushing hard, and then one day to live his dream of playing one down, getting a tackle, and being carried off the field at Notre Dame. Um, and, and so when I think of a biblical story that somewhat uh, relates, I think of the story of Joseph in Genesis uh, 37 through 50. And the story of Joseph is this. Uh, Joseph is one of 12 sons um, to his father, Jacob, um, and he is by far his father's favorite. And other brothers know it and hate him for it. And then when he's 17, his father decides to make him this really special multicolored coat that, that stands out among everybody else. And then his brothers really hate him. Um, and then he has a dream while he's 17. And he tells his brothers about the dream. He says, hey, look, I had a dream that we were all gathering grain. And then my grain pile stood up and all of yours gathered around and bowed to me. 
And his brothers go, what are you trying to say? Like, we are going to bow to you one day? And they hate him even more. Then he has another dream that the sun and the moon and 11 stars bow to him. And he decides to tell this to the whole family as well. And then his dad rebukes him and says, what are you trying to say? All of us are going to bow to you one day? Like, you're going to be above all of us? And so they really hate him at that point. And he's rebuked and he's ostracized for his dreams. And yet he still has these dreams that one day this will happen. Um, so what happens is he's out in the field one day and his brothers decide, let's get rid of him. They throw him down a well um, and they take his clothes and they, they cut him up and they put goat blood on him. And they tell his dad that he's dead. Um, but what they've actually done is they pull him back out of the well and sell him to, to be a slave in Egypt. And so when he gets to Egypt, he's sold to a, a man named Potiphar, who's the head of the guards. And um, as with everything in Joseph's life, um, God blesses him, and he does very well as a slave, and he ends up being the head of the household. And so he gives him control of of every house, um, Potiphar does, and he, he's in charge of everything. And uh, the Potiphar's wife comes and tries to, to seduce him. And he says, no, she doesn't like being rejected. So she goes and tells Potiphar that he came and tried to approach her. So he gets thrown into jail for doing the right thing. And we see this life and we see, okay, God, you've promised these things, but yet this keeps going down, down, down. He's a slave in Egypt. Now he's in jail. While he's in jail, he meets two people that the Pharaoh has placed in jail. One's a, a cup drinker. He, he makes sure there's no poison. And the other one's a baker. They have dreams one night and they're very troubled by it. And he tells them the interpretation of their dreams. It comes true. So years later, Pharaoh has a very scary dream. And the cup baker, the, the cup taster says, hey, there's this guy that's sitting in jail for like the last couple of years. He interpreted a dream once for me and it came true. You ought to talk to him. So Pharaoh brings Joseph out of jail. He spent years in jail. Pharaoh tells him the dream uh, and uh, Joseph tells him what it means. And Pharaoh says, you are so smart. God is with you. You are now second in control of Egypt, all of Egypt. So here he is, he is only below Pharaoh, and he has all of G Egypt under his control. And what he predicted comes true, that there would be a great massive abundance of food, and then there would be seven years of the worst drought ever. And the drought is so bad that people come from miles and miles away, hundreds of miles away to get food, because Egypt prepared and was ready for the drought, because that's what Joseph saw in the dream. And one of the people that come is his brothers. And so one day his brothers stand before him and they don't recognize him because he's probably dressed in Egyptian. Um, and, uh, and he's very interested if his younger brother is still alive, if they've been kind to him. And so he sends them back and says, I'll give you food when you bring back your other brother. Um, and they do. Uh, then he finally reveals himself to them. And the father comes down and they bring the whole family down and they lived in Egypt and they prosper. But here's, here's the big point. Um, the father dies, Jacob dies, and now it's just the brothers and him. And the brothers are terrified he's going to get revenge now. Now that the father's out of the way, he's going to get rid of all of them for what they did to him. And he says this really cool line. It's in your, uh, on your bulletin too. Um, but it says this. But Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done the saving of many lives. Um, and, and what's interesting about Rudy and Joseph, the parallel that I get is, is what Joseph pulls out, that we are, are all, hear me now, every one of us going to go through trials and tribulations and struggles. We are going to have things that we want that we just don't get. But the interesting thing about it is as Joseph points out, if anyone has reason to be mad with God, it's Joseph. Like, God gave him these dreams. He simply told people, and his life just goes downhill, 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 and then finally it gets redeemed. He, he probably could imagine sitting there saying, God, you could have just skipped right to the part where I was the head of Egypt. Like, I didn't have to do all that. But because of all that, that's how he got to take that place. That the trials and the struggles that we go through actually have a purpose and a plan and put us in the place that we need to be. Um, and, and what's interesting about this is I'm not going to go through and tell you, um, hey, whatever you're struggling with, one day God is going to give it to you. Because that's really what happens with these two stories. Because those, those are why they made a movie of Rudy. 
And there's a reason why Joseph's story is recorded in the Bible, because those are one in a million stories. For the other 999,999 stories that are in this room, they don't always end like that, do they? And that's what I want to talk about today. What do we do when it feels like everyone else is getting blessed except for us? What do we do when it's just hit after hit after hit after hit? And it seems like everyone else is getting their stories, their Rudy stories, their Joseph stories. They have, but I don't. And, and I, I think this is the three lessons that we're going to pull out today. Um, and the first one is this. Um, what are we supposed to do while we're waiting? While we are waiting for God to do something big, while we are waiting for God to redeem us, while we are taking hit after hit, what are we supposed to do? And look at Rudy, and we can look at Joseph. Let's look at Joseph more, because that's biblical. Um, but let's look at what they did. The first things they did were both of them were faithful to the place they were in. Just because they weren't where they wanted to be, it didn't mean that they sulked and they pouted and they said, well, forget this. I don't want to be a part of this. They were faithful to the place they were in. It says in the Bible that while Joseph was in jail for two years, he was such a good prisoner that the jailer put him in charge of all the other prisoners. How many of you would that be you? He's in jail for something he didn't even do. He turned down the wife and she lied about it and he's in jail for it, yet he's still being a faithful person to where he's at and he's getting rewarded by being the head of all the other prisoners. Be faithful to where you're at. Rudy did not want to be on the practice squad. Rudy did not want to have to do the things, but he was faithful to where he was at. He worked hard and he was patient. And the thing that we have to see in this is both of them kept their integrity and humility through that process. They didn't give away who they were. They didn't, they didn't settle for something less than they knew that they were supposed to. They didn't say, I deserve so much more. They humbly did what they were called to do, and they were faithful to the place they were at until God would do something different. And so that's our challenge, is to just keep trusting. And so my question for you is this, who are you while you're facing trials and you're waiting? What type of person are you? Are you a trusting person who waits faithful, who's dedicated and hardworking in wherever you're at? Or do you just sit back and say, you know what, God, I'll be good and I'll be faithful and I'll be kind when you give me what I want. But when I get there, I'm going to suck and I'm going to be bitter and I'm going to be angry. Who are you while you're having to wait? Because understand this, doing the right thing doesn't always go well. It ends well, but it doesn't always go well. Do you get the difference? Doing the right thing doesn't always pay off. We see that in this story. But we have to wait for things to happen in God's time. We have to wait for things to happen in God's time. And while we're in the place we're in, be faithful to the place you're in and give it your best. The second thing that we learn is this. What do we do when it doesn't happen for us? Okay, we've been waiting, we've been waiting, we've been waiting. And then all of a sudden, we don't have a Rudy story. We don't have a Joseph story. There is no redemption. It's done. What do we do then? How are we supposed to handle that? Because here's the thing. God hears your prayers, every single one of them. And yet sometimes he tells someone else yes, and you know, even though you've been asking for the very same thing. And sometimes it feels like God is being good to everyone else but you. And, and friends and family get answers for, and for prayers for uh, jobs and promotions and spouses and babies and blessings. And you're just left on the sidelines. That's what it's like. And you can feel forgotten. But here's the thing. God is good. And in Romans 8, 28, this is what it says. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Those who are called according to his purpose. And here's the crazy lesson in this. God's goodness for you, because this is what this verse tells us, that nothing in our life is, is void of God's goodness. That even the no's that he gives us in prayer are for our own good. And that seems crazy to us. Because we say, God, there are some really bad things in my life. How in the world could you say this is a good thing? And God's saying, no, no, no. I'm not saying everything in your life that is good. I'm saying I will work it for good. That none of it is empty. None of it is void. None of it just gets to be a sad ending to a sad story, period. I will work all things for good. 
And so we, we have this crazy issue where what's happening in our life doesn't seem like it could ever be good. How does this play out? And God's goodness for you is different than you might understand. So let's try and make sense of this. You have a specific path God wants you to live. You have a specific situation that God wants for you. And it doesn't mean you have to like it. Hear me as a pastor. It doesn't mean you have to like it. But you have to understand this. He is being good to you. And it is the path he has for you. And your path might be more difficult than that person's as you see it. Or it might not be as fun as that person. Or it might not be as blessed as that person as you see it. But it is the good path that he has chosen for you. And so what we need to do as Christians is we need to turn our eyes from everyone else. And, and we need to focus on our lives. Not looking at what everyone else is getting what everyone else is blessed with and concerning ourselves with their yeses and their noes and your yeses and your noes. Don't worry about them. God is running their life as he sees fit and he is running your life as he sees fit for you. You have a different path than them. You have different challenges than them. Don't taint your path with your expectations and say, well, God, you're not doing what I expect of you. So my path is a bad path. And God's saying, no, 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 no. Your path is just different. They have their trials too. And your lack of something is meant to do you good, not harm. And you may feel like you're in a season of lacking while everyone else is in a season of blessing. But here's the point. We cannot all be in the same seat at the same time. Does that make sense? Some of the people in this room are going to be in a season of blessing right now. And some of the people in this room are going to be in a season of heartache and struggle right, right now. We're not all going to be in the same season at the same time. And this is why we are a community. We are meant to share in each other's burdens and joys. And in the midst of whatever season we are in, we're called to do that. And that means that your season of rejoicing, you need to mourn with those who are mourning. And in your season of mourning, you need to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Because we are one family that unites together and helps one another. And as the years go by, what you're going to see is there will be a shift in and out of these seasons in your life and in other people's lives. And sometimes we find ourselves in the same season as one another, sometimes in different seasons of one another. But it is our calling to take care of one another. And so remember your specific set of circumstances, the ones you don't like and you wish weren't happening to you, were chosen for you by a God who has purposed them for your good. And even though that seems crazy to us, that's the truth. He is not out to get you. He loves you. He loves you. And he's working for you. And he's making you like him. And so be there for those around you, where, whether they are celebrating or whether they are mourning, whatever they are doing, and whether you are mourning or celebrating, be there for those around them. And, and thank God, even for the no's that he gives you in your life. And the third point that we understand is this. What if you're wrong? What if the dreams that you're holding God to and saying, you make this happen or else, I'm out. What if God is saying, that's never going to happen for you because I know what you need and you don't need that. It's interesting, the rest of Rudy's life, a lot of people don't know this. You would think Rudy would be at every football game loving Notre Dame. I mean, that was his dream. Rudy actually grew to hate Notre Dame. He wouldn't sign autographs. He wouldn't show up to anything. He hated people walking up to him on the street and talking to him. And it actually came to the point that he turned away from his faith and uh, he turned to a different faith. He joined uh, the Mormon church and now he supports the BYU football team and he's, he, he's a part of what they're doing. Um, and this is interesting because when you watch that movie, you go, oh, I bet he's just, he has his dream. He was carried off the field. He got everything he wanted. But here's the thing. Sometimes our dreams aren't God's dreams. And sometimes the things that we want most in life, when we get them, we realize they weren't what they were supposed to promise us. They didn't give us things that we thought. And sometimes God is trying to protect you and saying, no son, no daughter, you don't need that. That's not right for you. And we go, what do you mean that's not right for me? I can tell you this in my own life. It is a good thing that God does not bless me with abundant wealth. Because other people can handle that. I don't think I could. 
I don't think I could be the man that I was supposed to be if I had abundant wealth. It's just, that's who I am. So I can pray, God, make me rich. God, make me have all these things. But, but I kind of know about myself that that probably wouldn't be a healthy thing for me. I have prayed endlessly for God to make me six foot five. <laughs> Handsome and strong and well built and in shape. But here's the thing. I don't know that that would be good for me because I actually know myself pretty well. And I know that I would be the most arrogant dude around. I would. I would. I, I would be the most arrogant dude around if I was that. So even though I might want those things, God knows better. And so today, this is our challenge as we go into our time of confession. What where are you at in your story? Are you in a season of rejoicing? Are you in a season of mourning? And sometimes when we're in a season of mourning, we're bitter and we're angry, and we can't rejoice with those who rejoice. And we've been bridges because they have something that you wanted so badly. So we can't be friends anymore, or I can't go around that family member anymore. And we've burned bridges over this. And we need to confess that. Sometimes we've burned bridges with God because we're angry. We say, you aren't doing what I'm telling you to do. You aren't doing what I've dreamed of. You aren't doing the things that I know will make my life better. And God's saying, child, I love you. And it's just like us with our, our, our children. Sometimes they ask for things and you go, no, you don't need that. No. And sometimes we're so angry with God because we say, you're not giving me what I want. But he loves you and he's working all things for good. Have you learned the beauty of saying, thank you, God, for saying no to me? Because that's the challenge today. And that's what we get to go into a time of confession with. So I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes and join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, you are God. You love us. And you know all the things we need. And Lord, we pray that we would have cool stories. We pray that we would have these redemption stories that, that our, our lives, all the, the hits and the, the takes, all the hits that we take, would amount to something huge and great and grandiose, but sometimes that's not our story. Sometimes our story is much more simple that we just continue to hold on to you despite all the struggles. And we don't get to have that great moment. But Lord, help us love you throughout. Whether we're in the valleys or whether we're on the mountains, help us to never waver in you. And help us in this time to confess the times that we, we failed you that and we've hurt others and we've hurt you and our bitterness in our anger as we confess this to you now quietly to ourselves. Lord God, it is hard to trust you in all things. Forgive us for when we fail. Forgive us when we fail to, to acknowledge that you are in control. Forgive us when we hurt you and hurt others with our bitterness, with our lack of trust. And Lord, all these confessions that we have and the ones that we still need to confess, we pray that you would, you would convict our hearts and you would teach us to repent of them. In your name we pray, amen. The Lord Jesus Christ loves you. And this is the beauty of God, that he loves you so much that even when you're angry at him, he forgives you. He loves you so much that even when you belittle him, he forgives you. He loves you so much that even when you say, you know what, you're a worthless God, you don't do what I want you to do, even when you get the relationship wrong and you're against him, he still loves you and he forgives you. And he says, come back, come back. I'll forgive you. Trust me. And that's the beauty of our God. He loves us that much that you can trust him. When he forgives you of all things, you can know that he loves you and you can trust him, that he is working for your good, whatever that might be. And so the good news that I have is this, upon your confession, I get to announce to you that you have been forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.